On the 24th of April 1884, Germany formally proclaimed protectorate over Franz Adolf Eduard Lutreit's economic endeavors in the Bay of Angra Paniqua on Ludendorff's Buchen. By the end of August 1894, a German protectorate was established in German Sefrica, with Hoog becoming the capital of the colony by 1890. Between 1893 and 1907, German control gradually extended into the hinterland or the interior of the African country. With German authorities undertaking military operations against the Olams, the Namaz, the Bolanswatch, and the Herero to ensure their complete subjugation of the colony. The Herero Rebellion of 1904 to 1907 represented the most serious threat to German sovereignty in the colony. Luther de von Tolkra met the rebellion with extreme violence in what was called the first genocide of the 20th century. By 1907, the German pacification of Serbia's Africa was complete. The political boundaries of German Serbia's Africa were also fixed upon a number of discernible geographic features, which would aid in its defense. The southern boundary was the Orange River. The Atlantic coastline was the western boundary, so only ships could actually get into the colony. The eastern boundary was marked by the Kalahari Desert, so the railway line stretched from Santubi in the north to Kalafontaine in the south, connected to the German political centers at Weinhoek and Kielanstock. Two further parallel railway lines connected Ludendorff with Schienheim and Swakomont with Karabi. The railway line formed the lifeline of the colony. The climate of the colony was considerably healthy, although limited rainfall and access to water prevented any large-scale concentration of forces. The geography and the geographic climate of the region remain paramount in the defense of German Southwest Africa, though. Opposing war aims, armed forces, and the military organization in German Southwest Africa. In January 1914, the German Foreign Office instructed all colonies to revert to defensive measures in the event of war. The outbreak of the war, the outbreak of war would isolate the colonies from Germany since the Royal Navy would keep German shipping at bay. The civilian governors of the colony, which included Theodor Streitz of German Southwest Africa, favored colonial neutrality in the event of war, but would defend German sovereignty if needed. In German Southwest Africa, the military command of Colonel Johann von Heidelberg made optimal use of his central position within the colony to protect its borders and boundaries against invasion. So the railway network within the colony allowed Heidelberg to operate on interior lines of communication, offering him complete freedom of movement and action within the colony. He had planned to deploy his troops at four strategic locations throughout the colony. His forces were deployed at Weinhoek and Kemanstrop astride the railway lines connecting Rotschlitz and Schwachmarkmund with the Hitlerland. Hidebet intended to use his aircraft and mounted scouts, which were actually camel corps, to monitor the South African military movements along the colony's borders. In the event of an invasion, his troops would then harass the lines of communication of South Africa, realizing that access to water and good grazing areas would be the paramount factors influencing any South African invasion. Hidebet opted to use his troops to deny these resources to the invaders, which would be a scorcher policy. He, however, would still have the freedom to use his internal lines of communication, to retire and fall back to his supplies and strategic defenses as piecemeal. The Schutztruppen, or the colonial soldiers of South Africa, or German South West Africa, that Hedebert had at his disposal for the defense of the colony were well trained forces with ample experience in colonial warfare. The Schutztruppen answered directly to the colonial government of German foreign officers and numbered approximately 5,000 men. These would include 140 officers and 2,000 men of the Schutztruppe and 2,500 reservists, a camel corps, four field artillery batteries, a small air wing, 200 Afrikaner rebels, and 1,500 German policemen. The Stuart Super enjoyed a number of distinct privileges over any South African counterparts. Better military organization, a unified command structure, good training, and local knowledge of the terrain, and, well, you know what they would say in, the, in, in your neighborhood backtracks. Reflecting the German perception of German Southwest Africa as a colony of European settlement, the local force was almost entirely comprised of white troops. Given its recent history of conquest and, you know, almost genocide of the Herero and the Namak people, yeah, I'm pretty sure that would not go down well. Oh yeah, we tried to um, extinguish your race a, a while ago, but would you help us defend um, your oppression, please, from the even more brutal apartheid South Africans? They are not apartheid yet, but I promise you, they will be. <sighs> I don't know, man. You start to kill us. You, you start to kill us yesterday, you know. But I, I mean, nah. My wife said no, so you know. 
It's all good. But in East Africa, though, in East Africa, you're doing pretty good, though. Yes, I know. Yes, yes. One, one, one little word, Vic. He's a good guy. So, the military leadership of Hidebek was often questioned, but remained unpopular amongst his troops, which favoured his second-in-command, Major Victor Hranke, which would live longer than um, Hidebek because he died in 1914. So, on the 7th of August 1914, the British government requested that the Union of South Africa invade German Southwest Africa, um, designated as an urgent imperial service to Her Majesty. The Committee of Imperial Defense, or the CID, requested and required South Africa to capture the harbors of Ludwigsburg and Swakopmund, and the wireless stations of Weinhoek, Schokwapmund, and Ludwigsburg. The continued operation of wireless station hopping during the war was a threat to British and Entente shipping and also propaganda purposes, as they permitted Berlin to communicate with German warships at the high seas and spread propaganda to all well the truth to the American public. So on the 10th of August 1914, South Africa formally agreed to invade German Southwest Africa and meet all the CID's objectives. Parliamentary support for the invasion was granted in September 1914, and South Africa officially declared war on the 14th of September 1914. And while they were shipped to the west, our brothers at home were fighting in the west already. Well, German Southwest. The South African pretext of going to war was essentially driven by a scourge sub-imperialism of South African Prime Minister Louis Botha and his close ally Jan Smuts, both of which were in the Boer War and Boer Generals, but both men realized that the capture of German South West Africa could serve as the grounds for eventual incorporation of the territory into the Union of South Africa. It thus remained imperative that South African troops be used to invade German colonies so that, well, at the Paris Peace Conference they could say, we were there, we did this shit, give us this land. The South African High Command realised they had to act fast in a post haste in terms of their planned military offensives, for Britain could easily dispatch those Indians or Australian troops who occupied German South West Africa if they tallied too long. In fact, both had grander visions of a Southern Africa that incorporated all British High Command territories into the Union of South Africa. The UDF, or the Union Defence Force, or the South African Defence Force, mobilised approximately 100,000 men for active military service by 1914. Formed around the vestiges of an armed force for four former South African colonies of the Orange Republic, the Boer Republic, the Cape Colony, and the Transvaal. And of course, the UDF was also encompassing both Boer and British military traditions into their ranks. This had a direct impact on the nature, the organization, morale, and military preparedness and readiness for the UDF before the outbreak of war. By the latter half of 1914, the UDF was also comprised of four distinct elements. A small permanent force, a active citizen force, or the ACF, and the volunteer regiments, and the Defense Rifle Association, and a cadet corps for boys. With no coherent central staff at defense headquarters and a severe lack of trained staff officers in general, the UDF was in a perilous state. In a, it was in a shit show by September 1914. The South African plan for the military invasion of German South West Africa was finalized on the 21st of August 1914. The plan for the invasion allowed for three separate columns to converge on German South West Africa. A column or sea force under Colonel P. S. Bivers was to land at Rodenhochback and through help with Drone Navy destroy key infrastructure such as the wireless stations on the coast. Further south, Brigadier General Harry Timpson Lukin and his column of A-Force were then land at Port Nuttall and threatened the southern border of the colony. And the final column or B-Force under Lieutenant Colonel Samlas Godaras Marin Maritz would then invade German South West Africa from the east, with Uppington as its base of operation. The South African fighting contingent consisted mainly of white soldiers with black auxiliaries acting as a supporting role. The plan for the invasion of German South West Africa suffered from a number of flaws. Firstly, three fighting columns that were deployed. Firstly, three fighting columns that were deployed and spread out across a vast operational area stretching as far as acres of well, let's just say, 850 kilometers from let's just say Ludenhochback to Uppington. Ludenhoek back to the Atlantic Ocean and Ludenhoek back from the Kalahari Desert. Literal and lateral communication between the forces would become impossible. The South African operation would be directed from Pretoria 
and careful timing and coordination were necessary to ensure that three separate offensive operations gain local superiority over German forces. Or in other words, you shit out of luck, South Africa. So before the parliamentary approval was granted to invade Southwest Africa and the South African invasion, the Union of South Africa was thrown into turmoil. First there was the Matera Merich rebellion, but something less known was that on the 15th of September 1914, Brigadier General Christian Friedrich Bayer, the commander of the General of the ACF along with several other officers and men, resigned from the UDF in protest of the South African decision to invade German Southwest Africa upon imperial requests. They claimed that they had no quarrels with their German neighbors who were actively supporting them and they actively supported them during the Second Anglo-Boer War of 1999, well, 1899 to 1902. On the 16th of September 1914, the South African Parliament approved the invasion of German Southwest Africa anyway. On the operational front, events moved now swiftly. Beaver successfully occupied Ludwig Hookback on the 18th of September and accounted for all his objectives immediately. Whilst Lukin had his forces occupying the high grounds and border areas and posts of Ramen Durif, Homan Durif, and Gorodosh. Lukin also planned to invade German Southwest Africa from across the Orange River and then advance on the Schirheim von Ramen Durif, Rambad, and Kalafontein. The biggest obstacle for Lukin's advance remained access to significant water supplies for his forces and, well, the bloody obvious uh, Orange River in front of him and maybe even some people that he should have accounted for. A small force of South African troops occupied the waterholes at San Fontaine on the 19th of September 1914. Soon Pretoria pressured Lukin to occupy the positions and forced to hasten his advance to Warnbad. On the 26th of September 1914, the South Africans suffered a crushing defeat at the San Fontaine Heights at the hands of Heidebeck and his Schutzstorpen. Heidebeck made good news of his terrain, his interior lines of communication, and his superior forces at San Fontaine. Marais caused great concern when he failed to send Lucan reinforcements and openly support the Germans by sharing military information with them to the disposition of Lucan, of course. On the 9th of October 1914, the famous Martin Moritz Rebellion, or the Moritz Rebellion, went into open rebellion for the majority of the forces in Uppington and soon thereafter was immediately halted in the offensive and the operations were called off. So on the 9th of October 1914, remember that Marty Moritz rebellion thing I was talking about? Well, this is the guy. So in 1914, the Moritz rebellion went into open rebellion with the majority of his forces in Uppington actually going towards the rebellion and soon thereafter an immediate halt to offensive operations were called off. Victoria realized that it needed to first reorganize the UDF and deal with the Africana Rebellion and, well, the Africana British Strife and the German Corporation kind of stuff. Within its own borders first, before it could complete the conquest of German Southwest Africa. In the latter half of December 1914, the Africana Rebellion had been crushed, and Botha and Schmutz could once again focus their attention on the conquest of German Southwest Africa. Schmutz drew up a new plan for the invasion of the German colony. Schwarzkopfmound and Walvis Bay would then be used as a staging area for the direct advance on Weinhook. Both had assumed the overall command of the South African invasion, thereby ensuring unity of command in the political and military spheres of influence of the campaign. Schmutz believed that separate attacks along the different axes would deny the German forces their news of their interior lines of communication, their only advantage, and ensure the UDF or the Union Defense Force operational success. Both and Smuts aimed to destroy Hirabet Schutzstruppen in the field, thereby preventing a guerrilla campaign from ensuing like they did in the east, with von Lothar still running amok in East Africa. Four different forces converged on German Southwest Africa during early January 1915. The northern force, under the personal command of Botha, operated from Walvis Bay and were threatened German military and political seats at Weinhoek. Botha's northern force was the principal South African force in the field and was compromised of approximately 20,000 men by February 1915. The eastern force, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Christian Anthony Lawson Barenge, operated from Karuman and was tasked with threatening the eastern border of German Southwest Africa with an advance across the Karahali Desert. The central force under command of Brigadier General Sir Duncan Mackenzie was tasked with advancing from Rothenkirk back via Ost towards the strategic railway junction between Simenheim and on towards to Cayman Stop, and then onwards to Cayman Stop. Under the command of Colonel Jacob Lee van Venscher, 
the South African and the Southern Force would then threaten the southern half of German South West Africa from their base from Uppington and Port Nuttall across the Orange River. The reorganization within the UDF had a distinct impact on the leadership and the command structure of the invading force. Both are appointed only trusted style walls to lead the offensive operations against the Germans, thereby abandoning the former policy of language equity and provincial representation within the UDF. Preferences towards preferences preference was given preference was given towards more competent commanders who were willing to wage war with the Germans, which included Connie Bright, Marine Hotha, Jacob van Winter, Johannes Alboch, and Christian Baranga. Both have realized that the real fight was against the harsh geography and climate of German South West Africa. An array of auxiliary troops including engineers, medical and even veterinary personnel, transport and logistic troops, armored car and even aeroplanes supported their forces. The second invasion of South West Africa the invasion the second, South Africa, the second South African invasion of German South West Africa was a Stratato affair, with operational advances predetermined by the availability of water and grazing in German South West, especially across the Kalahari. Frank, who proceeded, nevertheless, Frank, who had succeeded Hedebeck after his untimely death on the 12th of November 1914, completely underestimated the South African operational mobility and even his success. Frank chose to fall back on Hedebeck strategy, responding to piecemeal to South African operational movements. While the UDF was left to struggle in the inhospitable nature and geography of German South West Africa, the high speed of the South African maneuvers and operational envelopments, however, in the field ensured that Botha had made steady gains by the end of March 1915. In the south and east, the combined efforts of Van Venta and Baranga's forces ensued and ensured the capture of Calafontaine on the 5th of April 1915. Mackenzie's forces occupied Oss on the 30th of March 1915 and only resumed their advance in Gabon towards the end of April due to the ever-present problem of access to water. In the north, Botha recaptured in the north, Botha captured the right and Jacques Ross Walter by the 24th of March 1915 and was forced to withdraw from Swakopat Mon due to water scarcity. By the 26th of April 1915, Gabon and Trek on Gies had been captured, forcing Frank to retreat further into the north. During the latter half of 1915, Frank faced another serious internal military threat within German Sefe Sefrika. On the 28th of April 1915, the Rehoboth Bashers uh, mix of ethnicities and dubious loyalties went into open rebellion due to the looming political and military power vacuum in central German Southwest. The Robof bastards offered Bochter a token military force he could use in the offensive operations against the Germans. Bochter vehemently refused this offer in the premise of this was a white man's war. Frank and his forces were forced to deal with both the internal and external threat of German sovereignty to German Southwest which resulted in the launching of a punitive raid against the Rehoboth bastards, marked by excessive violence and levels of violence and reprisals on the clan, or, well, the tribe. On the 8th of May 1915, the expedition had to be called off due to the South African advance from the south. By the 5th of May 1915, the South Africans successfully captured Karabib, uh, which after they occupied one hook on a pose on the 15th of May 1915. South Africa had met South Africa had met all the CRD's objectives that had been set out in August 1914. By the 21st of May 1915, Scheitz proposed an armistice to Botha based upon the territorial status quo. Botha and Smoltz wanted to completely incorporate the territory into the Union of South Africa and outright ignored the proposal. On the, eight, on the 18th of June 1915, Botha resumed his advance against the German forces in the north of the colony through a series of forced marches and operational envelopments. On the 1st of July 1915, Botha's forces successfully advanced on Otavi Fontaine, which forced Seitz and Frank to reconsider their military and political options. On the 9th of July 1915, Botha accepted the surrender of German South West Africa at Otavi Fontaine after a successful South African campaign marked by a high degree of operational mobility and maneuver. The high degree of operational mobility during the campaign ensured a relatively low casualty rate. 529 South Africans and approximately 1,188 German casualties respectively. But damn, that is almost 2,000. And that is barely like a, a year, barely a year into World War One. so damn.
The South African occupation heralded some minor developments in both the economic and the infrastructural spheres of territory, following the cessation of hostilities in 1918 and 1919. Initially, the South African Authority did not want to repatriate Germans from German Southwest Africa on the basis of humanitarianism. But by 1918, approximately 6,000 German residents had been deported back to Germany, with some actually leaving willingly. In turn, South Africa opted to resettle the territory with poor rural Afrikaners, thereby strengthening their presence in the territory, like um, Russians and Britons going to places to strengthen them, even the Han Chinese. Militarily the, militarily, the UDF troops garrisoned it effectively suppressed a number of internal threats to the Union sovereignty, which included deposing the Uwambo chief, Madum Ye Nadim Yofayo, in February 1917. By 1920, the League of Nations granted South Africa a classy mandate over German South West Africa, which effectively incorporated the territory into the Union of South Africa politically, economically, and on a military level. The military actions did not necessarily determine the outcome of South Africa's invasion of German South West Africa during 1914 to 1915. It was the ability of the UDF to overcome the unforgiving nature and geography of the colony that made it the difference in getting it or not. 100,000 men to 5,000 men, please. The main, the high degree of mobility and operational envelopments marked the UDF's offensive operations, and we'll see them come back in the future in World War II and during the Bush Wars and Cold War conflicts of the communists in the Southwest. But most importantly, their constant need to, but most importantly, their constant need to secure the access to water was their main downfall. The German defenses in the colony were haphazard and lacked real strategic direction and they didn't even want to fight, but it was invaded. The successful South African conquest of German South West Africa was but the start of the Union's contribution to the war effort. The Union subsequently served in East Africa, the Middle East, France and even Flanders. And even, I would say even like um, in the Atlantic and in 1919 with the Siberian intervention. But well, those are stories for another day. Um, I already got an uh, outro, so um, wash your hands, keep safe. My nose was stuffy, but um, I, did, I did pretty good. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed. I might do two more, but um, I think that was pretty good, though. What it was, pretty damn good. Anyway, guys, um, hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. And um, I will see you next time. Anyway, I'm just going to do this just in case. And um, yeah, that's pretty much me. So learn something and um, watch me from 10 minutes in the past. Enjoy. Hope you enjoyed. Not the best, but um, I think there's one more thing. But um, I think that's pretty much it. But anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed. Hope you like it. I might re-record just in case. I'm not going to say that was perfect, but I still got like 10 minutes before my grandmother gets home. Yeah, it's a ghost town, honestly. Like um, the ABC buses, which take an hour, now take like 30 minutes or even 25 minutes if you're a lucky bastard. Because um, nobody's really going to work. Nobody's really trying to go outside unnecessarily. If you have to go to work, you have to go to work. Um, but it's pretty quiet though. Like not a lot of people on the streets. Most businesses are closed. 10 to 5, 10 to 4, that kind of stuff. Like if you're actually working, like even I, when I went to work the other day, but I have a terrible cough, it will be edited out. Trust me. And when I when I cough, I would either start back or continue from the dock. So you don't worry about a cough unless... It's in this because I don't edit this for shit, so sorry about that. But um, anyway, pretty quiet, pretty, yeah. But remember to wash your hands. Remember, if you're gonna mask, wear a mask if you're sick, like me. And um, good luck. And don't be, f no, you'll get out of this, boys. We'll get out of this, boys and girls. Just nothing to do. We'll make it, man. We'll make it. But anyway, hope you enjoyed the invasion of Jimmy Sipris Africa. It will be done tonight. I think there's one more clip I have to do, so I would um, I will see what that is right now, and while I'm doing the re-recording, actually do that. So um, thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed, and hopefully this is good enough. But <laughs> I'm not taking any chances. So anyway, hope you learned something, and I guess I will still cut it from this. Yeah, I will still cut it from this. So anyway, enjoy. At least I know all the words now, so at least I could breeze through it here quickly. So it shouldn't be that bad. I might still trip up on a word, but it is easy, you know. Anyway, guys, I'm the Doomslayer. Nah, not really. 
I'm gonna play some old school Doom later though. But anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something, and I'll see you. I don't know I might try and do something Friday, and the amount is what. Um, yeah, I don't want to drag this on too long because she's gonna. Actually, she should be leaving work home. My grandmother should be leaving work home now. So, yeah, let me not drag this on. So, uh, wait, hold on. There's a calendar right in the corner. Boom, boom, boom. Got a new phone, guys. Sir, thirty-first is a th Tuesday. So I guess this Friday and Saturday I could start recording the naval blockade of Cuba or the water portion of the. Cuban Missile Crisis. Anyway, guys, um, I'll see you later. And yeah, it's a collab with um, my boy, my my cool kid, the coolest kid in the history sphere, Captain Caleb. Um, yeah, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but I don't know I'm bored as shit. And I said I would do it, so I, I would do it, even if I have to do all three. But I'll see what he's still want. I'll see what he thinks. I don't I don't know. It's like. 5 o'clock here, going on to probably like 4, probably like four o'clock in the morning or even 5 o'clock. I don't know, New Zealand time is weird, but um, stay safe, wash your hands, and um, yeah, get ready for that video this weekend. So, uh, yeah, that's something to eat and do that.